Okay, good, uh, <clears throat> good morning, good morning. Uh, if you would please bring your animated conversations to a close, put a pause, you can start them up again uh, in about an hour's time. Uh, I'm Jeff Mould from Nestle, and I'm going to moderate this next session where we're going to dig into some of the sort of specific examples of what's being done uh, around Europe in particular, new sort of models of the collaborative economy, and we'll try and pick apart what's working, maybe some of the challenges where this whole field might go uh, next. As Helen said at the beginning, in a way, what we're talking about is not very new. Discussion of how the internet can aggregate resources or people's time or people's ideas was being talked about 20 years ago. And in some ways, it's surprising how long it's taken to create some new kind of models at scale. And I think it's also in some ways surprising that the commercial world, relatively recently, only in this decade, thanks to huge injections of venture capital money, has made the Airbnbs and Ubers and so on part of daily life. But what we're going to try and focus on in this session is what might a more pluralistic collaborative economy look like, what would its elements be, perhaps what might some of the policies be. And I think there's a parallel with other fields. Um, and I'm just going to mention two before I turn to our, our speakers. One is broadcasting. So when radio and TV came along, they could have been entirely commercial uh, economies funded by advertising. Instead, in most countries like this, it was decided to go for a much more mixed economy where there were some commercial providers, advertising finance, but also here we have a BBC, public sector bodies, some which are regulated um, uh, with a deliberate sort of cultural or social purpose. And I think most of us think that's a healthier way to run something as important as, as news, for example. Similarly, in health, um, most countries have decided to, to run their health economies as plural economies, with some for profit, some purely public sector, uh, and usually a very large civil society NGO component as well. And I think one of the premises of this event is the healthy future for a, is probably equally mixed. Yes, there'll be some very commercial, big platforms, but we want their equivalents in the public sector, in civil society, uh, reflecting different values to be as strong and as much part of daily life as is the case, I say, in fields like news, health, and many others. Many others. So to help us navigate what that might mean, we've got some fantastic speakers. I'll introduce them one by one as they speak. But first of all, we're going to hear from my colleague Peter Beck, um, who has been a sort of guru on this field, uh, overseeing, uh, overseeing lots of uh, research studies, um, both of the collaborative economy, digital social innovation, but also of new kinds of finance. And uh, Peter, over to you. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so I'm going to spend four, maybe five minutes talking you through what we think this looks like. And then luckily we got some real experts doing stuff to tell us about what they do. Um, so just to kind of to take one step back, uh, at Nesta, kind of in our work, when we say the collaborative economy, uh, we kind of talk about it in four main ways. The idea of kind of collaborative consumption, uh, collaborative production, collaborative learning, and collaborative support to distinguish between the different types of exchange and activity within the collaborative economy and, and why people participate for those in, within those different models. However, kind of uh, leading up to this event, I was trying to kind of understand what uh, do we actually know around kind of what we can call the kind of the social purpose collaborative economy, and I realised that we know nothing, uh, or very little at least. Uh, if you look at uh, kind of most public policy strategies, research papers, they focus on a very very narrow set of sectors, from to do with rides and to do with letting, Airbnb and Uber. Um, Similarly, when you look at uh, kind of uh, market studies, while we kind of aware that this was a fast-growing market, uh, the European Commission estimates that uh, four billion was generated in revenue last year alone uh, in the collaborative economy, and it uh, uh, could grow to being a market worth about 572 billion in the future. There is no mention of social impact, uh, social motivation, social value in any of those uh, either research papers. Or in, if I go down to the, to the pub and have a chat to my mate, they will know nothing about this market beyond uh, a very, very narrow set of uh, providers. However, um, there is a, a kind of growing market of, uh, of kind of purpose collaborative economy. 
and perhaps uh, the only place where we know a little bit about how only place where we know a little bit about how fast this is growing and the, the proportion this makes up of the more mainstream collaborative economy is the studies we've been doing at Nest on, on crowdfunding. So uh, what you have on this slide here is kind of the overall growth of crowdfunding in the UK from 2012. This is a story I've been telling many, many times uh, of kind of a rapid growth, 267 million of investments, loans, donations back in uh, 2012. Fast forward last year, 3.2 billion uh, in investments and, and loans and now kind of a very mainstream finance market. However, kind of within only around about 81 million went to good courses. So the majority is startup investments, business loans, personal loans. However, we are seeing kind of the market for using crowdfunding platforms and, and kind of social lending platforms to invest in, in good projects uh, grow quite fast. So between 2014 and 2015, this market more than doubled. And Phil from Crowdfund is on the panel later on to talk a bit more about this. However, um, kind of moving beyond kind of market numbers and statistics, we do know that this is a, a, a growing movement. There is, as we heard, there is, as we heard this morning from the mayors, but also from a lot of the people in the room, there is a growing movement of people, organizations, projects who are pioneering uh, the idea of what a social purpose collaborative economy could look like and what it can help us achieve. And if you think about in the kind of idea that what people tend to be three different things, either kind of knowledge and skills, money or assets. And I've tried to kind of just talk you through kind of examples of what that looks like where it has a social purpose. So on this slide here you have Wheelis, uh, also based in Paris. There seems to be a lot of great stuff happening there. Wheelis takes the idea of, of, of kind of renting a car from a pier but get instead of kind of that just being a car for a ride to the pub on holiday, this is a car for people with disabilities. So uh, if you have a, a car where you can take a wheelchair, for example, and you have that car, you can rent it to other people who uh, need a wheelchair um, a fitted car but might not be able to afford that for as little as 60 euros a day. And it's taking that same idea of peer rental but applying it to a real social problem around mobility. You have Olio there as well. It's an app for sharing food waste. So if I have a bag of carrots and some minced meat left in my house and I would like to give it to some neighbors, I can put it out on Olio, so can uh, local shops, and that can help us reduce food waste in cities. And there are many, many apps out there that are trying to aggregate assets and share them better within communities. Similarly, we have the kind of skills, knowledge, and learning where we have people contributing their own ideas, their opinions, uh, and their knowledge, their research to solving social challenges. Uh, probably my favorite example, and we'll hear Chris Lintot later today talk about citizen science, is the idea of getting the public involved in doing research. So uh, Cell Slider it got 2 million people involved in uh, tackling some of the biggest research challenges around uh, cancer research. And over there on the, on the left, you have Better Reykjavik, which is a platform for sourcing ideas from citizens a bit like uh, the Madame Mayor example we heard from this morning, uh, to get uh, ideas into uh, Reykjavik's parliament. Uh, so far, I think so more than 200 uh, plus ideas have, have been implemented based on kind of sourcing ideas and getting discussions from people around what would you like to happen in the city and how should the city spend its money. And finally, we have the idea of money and alternative finance. So um, uh, Space Life is one example of really taking the idea of crowdfunding but applying it to the idea of, of public spaces. So that up there is, I think, the UK's biggest water slide funded in Bristol through Space Hive a couple of years ago. Um, but every day we see parks, allotments, community centers being funded, taken over, run through different types of finance and investment. It's just about startups and small businesses. It's also about community projects and parks and so on. And so on. However, I just want to leave, and this may be a prompt for the panel, what I think is needed to grow the collaborative economy. First of all, we need many more experiments, like the ones we've seen in, in, in Paris, where we really try and put public money and public risk and public policy behind some of these ideas to see what they mean for public services. We need more awareness. We need stuff like today's event, but many more of them around the country. Increased understanding of the different models out there and how they can help us tackle different public challenges. And hopefully the fund that we launched this morning can help advance that agenda. And finally, this is the research enemy saying more research is needed, but we do really know, need to know a bit more around kind of what actually works, who's doing it, what's the size of the market, what motivates people to participate. Is this just a London hipster phenomenon or can we really grow this across the country? And I think that bit is still really missing for this market and I'd really welcome any researchers out there willing to work with us on really understanding the per, the, both the potential and the challenges within, within this. Uh, so I promise we're really, really short and my time's up. Uh, so I'll hand over to the next speaker uh, now, but I hope that all makes sense. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Is, is there anyone in the room from Reykjavik? Certainly. Because that 70,000 figure is quite extraordinary because I think Reykjavik only has a population of about 80,000. <laughs> so it's like almost everyone um, appears to have used that uh, platform, which I think is, is a sign of getting to scale. Um, we're now going to hear from Phil uh, Geraghty uh, from Crowdfunder. 
uh, which has become I mean, a, a, a very significant part of that growing scene which Peter described. You're going to show a little bit about your experiences. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. So um, what does Crowdfunder do? So Crowdfunder set up three and a half years ago, and our intention was to help people all over the UK make their ideas happen by collaboratively funding them. So people can come to Crowdfunder, they can put up their idea, they can share it with their friends, and they can get funded. <coughs> what I want to show you today is just a little snippet of some of the, the projects that I absolutely love, some of the ones that really uh, epitomise what crowdfunding is. So crowdfunding is a very wide term. It basically covers a lot of different things. We split the market roughly into kind of five different sections. So you've got donation crowdfunding, where you're just giving with absolutely no return whatsoever. You've got rewards crowdfunding, where you can take something tangible back. Uh, community shares is a fantastic tool for allowing communities to buy assets, buying local pubs, turning things into community-run businesses. And then you've got peer-to-peer -peer lending and equity crowdfunding as well. I'm going to talk to you about the three on the, the left of that today. So what we've done over the last three and a half years, we've been fortunate enough to work with 55,000 projects over the last three and a half years from all over the UK. Um, and that number is only growing. On, on the current trajectory, we'll work with 150,000 over the next three years. It gives you the size of scale. In our first month, we had three projects go live. So th the size of growth in this industry is quite huge. Um, we've raised almost 30 million pounds. <coughs> that should tick over 30 million pounds in the next week or so for those projects all over the UK. So who's crowdfunding? So we've got, on our platform, we've got everything from businesses right across to charity. We're big believers that actually businesses should be more community focused and crowdfunding helps bring them that way. And we're also big believers that charities should be more sustainable and commercial and it helps bring them that way as well. And right in the sweet spot of that is social enterprises that we work with. So I wanted to pick out four projects that, that I absolutely love. And the first one is live currently. Uh, it's called Yoga for Refugees. It's a young lady called Emily. It's based in Hackney. And she's working with refugee communities to help them integrate into British life, to help them get over some of the anxiety and sleep issues that they have when they come over. And yoga is just a very simple way of doing that. She's right at the cutting edge of how uh, society is dealing with an issue like that. And as such, funding for an area like that is sometimes quite hard because people don't understand it fully. But the crowd, in that sense, are ahead of the the funding industry, which I think is really interesting. So she's got 87 backers so far. They've invested four and a half thousand pounds and her target is 7,200. So we're all here talking about collaboration. I'd love for, by the end of this session today, that she gets to 100 backers from the people in this room. So if you like what she's doing, go and have a search for it. It's Yoga for Refugees. Um, you can search for it on the Crowdfunder website and back that project. This is another one that I absolutely love. So this is Matt and the team at Freedom Bakery. They run a bakery inside a prison in Glasgow. So they're teaching prisoners how to bake, they're giving them skills, giving them experience in the workplace so that when they exit prison, they've got a better chance of, of getting on with life. And uh, Matt gave me a crazy statistic uh, the other day, which was that uh, to keep a prisoner, basically when someone comes out of prison, if they can get into work and not back into prison, it saves the Scottish government £950,000, which is absolutely phenomenal. So the work they're doing there is really important to let them understand. So they raised £16,000. 28 days from 269 backers to open up a separate part of the bakery which is now outside the prison. So they're moving ahead with this project at the moment. There'll be a separate part that's outside the prison so they can integrate more with society. <coughs> this is my third project that I absolutely love, Trash to Treasure. So these guys in Gloucestershire uh, were faced with the local council wanting to set up a massive incinerator where they'd burn absolutely everything without sorting it first. Um, and the local community, including Jeremy Irons, who's in the video, said, actually, we're not really happy with this. We think there's a better solution. Actually, we're not going to wait for someone else to do it. We're going to propose it ourselves. So they've put forward a, a recycling plant where they think they can get 90% of the waste back into usage. They raised the first £80,000 for the proof of concept. They're going forward. It's a £20 million project. They're going forward to try and raise the rest of it through traditional finance. But they use this one to get the 168 local people invested in it. This is a community share offer. So the community actually own this enterprise, and this enterprise will be responsible for distributing the the waste afterwards. All the uh, profits from that organisation is going to go back into this organisation to help more circular economy projects throughout Gloucestershire. And the last one I'm going to talk about is the community channel. I think it's channel 67 on Freeview, if anyone hasn't seen it. Fantastic project. These guys have been going for a number of years, highlighting great community projects all over the country through television. Um, they got to a point last year where they're like, how do we take this forward? They went, actually, it suits us to be community owned. 
let's actually get our viewers to buy into us and be part of us. So they are community-owned, it's a cooperative model, community shares, and they are working now to set up the organisation. It's really interesting. I bought shares in them myself, 50 quid, got me involved with it. And what's really interesting in this is they've now uh, sent out an email to all the shareholders saying, we're looking for directors. Who wants to come forward and help us run this organisation? And the uh, shareholders will also then all be voting on the directors. So they're involved in the long-term journey. And that's what we're seeing more and more in the crowdfunding space. It's people involved in the long-term journey of the project and where it's going. I wanted to leave you with one last thing. So one of the things that we've noticed is that projects uh, don't just do crowdfunding, they don't just do grant funding, they don't just do loans. It's a whole funding cocktail. They're getting funding from all over the place. And part of our responsibility is to help them along that journey. So we've been working with organisations like Plymouth Council. Plymouth Council have £60,000, which they distribute to community projects through us. And that's where the crowd can show their demand for a project first. They'll raise 25% of it. The local council will then look at it, and if they wish to back the project, they can then drop another four or five thousand pounds onto that project from council funds. So that blend of different funding from the crowd and from local councils. We're also doing some work with the Arts Council and Heritage Lottery Fund alongside Nesta researching it. Uh, we've also got a social enterprise fund with Santander. All these funds are now starting to come into the crowdfunding world. So the crowd is kind of growing. We've got about 750,000 people in our crowd on the website but it's growing in different ways with grant funders coming involved, councils coming involved, and, and also businesses. Um, so please, go back and uh, fund this project. Where is it? Go back in the slides. Yoga for Refugees, go fund it today. Let's get them over 100. Thank you very much. <clears throat>well, there'll be time to ask Phil any detailed questions in the second half of this session, and I'll ask you, so where might this be in five years' time? Is it just more of this, or, or will the sort of work you do change uh, in nature? And I think just, just one comment, um, which probably applies to everything we're talking about today. Some aspects of this are incredibly new. The fact that you can, in the next few hours, give money to Yoga for Refugees, that was not possible you know, even 10 or 20 years ago. But some of this is very old. And if you were in a city like London or most of the cities of Europe, you know, 150 years ago, most finance for most people was collaborative. It was building societies, it was mutuals, it was people coming together to meet each other's needs. And only much later did sort of big business move in, governments move in with welfare states. So in some ways we're, we're recovering so sort of forgotten memories, but, but in ways which use very radically new tools which were not available in the past. Um, our next speaker is Mario Fustamorel, who in a way is, so comes from a, an interesting example of that history from Barcelona, uh, working on the collaborative economy and commons. And Barcelona is one of those cities which has a great history of collaboration and social movements, which then was suppressed for many years, in a way. Uh, but it is really coming back to the fore, partly thanks to the mayor elected last year. Mayo, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, so what does a social purpose collaborative economy look like in Barcelona? So I'm going to provide all examples in Barcelona. First thing is it lo looks very numerous. Uh, we have identified 100, 340 experiences. Uh, this is in a directory of the peer-to-peer -peer value project, European project, and you can uh, download it. So we have many, that's to start. And then uh, how does it look like? It looks like a social shift of the economy after the 2008 uh, uh, crisis turnout. There is actually a book by Manuel Castells who has been identifying how far in uh, Barcelona there has been growing alternative economical practices since the uh, latest uh, crisis. At the moment, 10% of Barcelona economy is based on cooperatives. It's not 30% like in Bologna, but still we see collaborative economy as the possibility to scale social economy into becoming uh, mainstream. Uh, the evolution of uh, collaborative economy in Barcelona. First, we have what we call the open commons model, which is based on uh, non-for-profit foundations with a, a participative uh, governance uh, system. We have uh, Wikipedia, which the second Wikipedia to start was the Catalan one, so we didn't uh, invent it, but still uh, we have uh, uh, contributed to it. Also Goteo, which is a, a crowdfunding uh, platform uh, similar to the one uh, we just uh, uh, heard. 
So it's basically not in a foundation with a democratic uh, uh, governance. The te type of technology uh, favor technological sovereignty because it's based on free and open source software project. And the type of knowledge is based on open knowledge. After this first model, we have seen the uh, emergence of the unicorn modality, adopting European Union uh, uh, concept to characterize this model of Airbnb, in which we did not invent it, but Barcelona is one of the uh, cities with larger offers and uh, uh, exchange uh, in Airbnb. Actually, what uh, um, was embedded in Barcelona is Street for Real, which has been is a startup about uh, getting uh, local guides in order to uh, bring you to tourist experience in the city. Was funded in Barcelona, and now it's a startup that has been bought by uh, Airbnb. In contraposition to the Open Commons model, these are corporates with a centralized governance is based on closed technology or proprietary technology and locked knowledge. Uh, the last uh, model to appear that uh, it's a reaction to the unicorn modality is what we call platform cooperatives or open uh, uh, cooperatives, in which uh, is based on a small and medium enterprise cooperatives, uh, also free and open source software uh, technology, and sometimes open knowledge. The element of the open knowledge is still there because actually, traditionally, the cooperative movement has a uh, had, has not uh, injected into open uh, uh, commons as uh, it could be. And here we have the case of Fermondo, which is a cooperative of um, uh, owners of a platform which, which exchange ethical uh, consumer uh, goods. So there is one million products being uh, uh, sell or exchange in Fermondo. And, uh, and uh, it started in Berlin, but now it's being connected to a local uh, cooperative called, called uh, Abacus, which uh, uh, it's a traditional cooperative um, which was founded in 1969. Uh, it has a, a 90 million uh, income every uh, year and one million members. And what happened with Abacus is that Abacus is based on a bookshops selling books. But now with the emergence of Amazon and eBay, they are getting in crisis. So decided to move into a platform uh, service in order to uh, continue as a cooperative. And so uh, we are seeing the, the possible convergence between Fermondo uh, as a cooperative which emerged on the digital culture with Abacus, which is a local cooperative with a historical tradition and very big uh, to uh, connect. Uh, another example of platform cooperatives in Catalonia is called the Cooperati Cooperativa Integral Catalana, Integral Cooperative, which is actually a transversal cooperative. Uh, members can uh, uh, do their taxes like freelance uh, through the cooperative, or you can be a member as a group and you can sell services in, internally. So it's an innova innovation in the type of cooperatives which allowed uh, supporting a collaborative economy and uh, cover and uh, the, the creation of internal markets uh, in the communities. Uh, other example of open commons in Barcelona has been already presented is the case of Wifinet. And it, uh, Wifinet is a very good example in order to understand what commons, uh, uh, the soul of the commons. The soul of the commons is in, is, uh, in the context in which um, neither the state or the market are providing solution, uh, communities uh, grow in order to provide it. This was uh, in, Barcelona, in uh, Catalonia, in the Pyrenees, there was not internet access uh, because it was not uh, uh, profitable for markets to give internet access to very few people in the, in the mountains. Administration was not getting also the lead to assure access to the internet. And in this context in which market, neither market, neither state was providing a solution, communities of citizens uh, inject in order to develop a, a infrastructure, a commons infrastructure governed by the community. And today is the largest uh, community infrastructure uh, uh, worldwide and robust. Last year, European Commission gave Wifinet a prize, not because it's great technology, but because it's great economical model, because uh, it's based on a commons, which is the infrastructure being governed uh, by the community. But around this, there is an ecosystem of uh, small foundations, cooperatives, which provide uh, locally uh, uh, supplement uh, services. Uh, 
here, uh, Commons uh, framework came mainly through the ideas of uh, Eleanor Ostrom, who was the Nobel Prize winner in 2009, uh, uh, which uh, proved that Commons sometimes are much more effective ways of production than non-market process state. And uh, Benkler, which uh, takes some of the idea of, of Ostrom, which was mainly focused on natural resources and bring it into the digital uh, Commons. More example of open commons in Barcelona. In childcare, we have a very large uh, movement of alternative childcare. Here we have Babelia, uh, which is a community of, uh, uh, of uh, 15 kids, which uh, they uh, have an alternative pedagogy and they can um, uh, innovate in pedagogies through these communities of uh, taking care of uh, childs. But we also have a, a new experience, which is called Robaneta, which means friendly uh, uh, clothes, which is very interesting because it's combining the public administration infrastructure of civic centers with the exchange of, uh, of clothes. So basically, uh, Robaneta is a website where you can exchange uh, clothes of childs. But because uh, it needs infrastructure to have physical places where to bring the, the, the clothes, the Barcelona City Council has put uh, uh, available the, the civic uh, centers for Robanete in order to have uh, public infrastructure to do this. So it's a very good uh, mix between a civic uh, initiative for exchanging clothes with the city um, municipality, which understand the needs of the infrastructure for this initiative and provide it. Another example is Fab Labs and Green Labs, which you already know, it's very uh, famous and has been already presented. The social centers uh, of the re reindustrialization of centers for the building. And here, let me please uh, explain this one. On housing, we have with the PA, which is a platform for people organized uh, in order to uh, uh, be solidarian with the people who cannot pay the mortgage. Because in Spain, if you don't pay the mortgage, you lose the house, but you still have to pay the mortgage. So it's a very hard uh, situation. <laughs> So there has been a, 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 a collaboration between those uh, in this situation, which has been very good for anti-racial racist uh, a movement because solidarity between immigrants and locals and has evicted with this way 2,045 evictions and has allocated house for uh, uh, 50,000 families. And the founder of this movement is Ada Colau, or mayor. So this, can, which is uh, here, this is Ada Kola. So this point about the political uh, uh, potential of uh, collaborative economy when, when our mayor is one of the founders of a key experience in the city. Uh, uh, more examples of platform cooperatives in Barcelona. You will see that the three examples start call it some energy, we are energy, some connection, we are connection, some mobility, we are mobility. The three of them are like, uh, uh, they, they are like um, using the same idea of creating cooperative for exchanging energy between uh, uh, and consumer, collaborative consumption and exchange of alternative energy. Uh, some connection is about service of, tele, of uh, com, com, telephones and, and communication services. And mobility is about exchange um, electric uh, bikes, cars, or motorbikes. And they are like, uh, we see that a model that is, it works, the model of we are something, and it's being spreading into several uh, uh, ambits, and they are exchanging a uh, um, community. And this is the way of scaling a successful case into another uh, areas. And it's very much important to see also how far this is talking about the importance of identity, because they are called what we are is what we share, in the sense of we are something means it's very connected to of, of what is the identity of the people uh, how, uh, engaging in with their type of consumption and uh, sharing practices. Uh, and Last, uh, other departing points to platform cooperatives, we ha have Lasum. Lasum was a startup, a normal startup, uh, and digging into inclusive experiences in which you can connect with other people uh, in order to have a, a, a nice experience in the cities. And they decided to become a cooperative because of the environment of support cooperatives in the city. Uh, again, Abacus, I have explained it, a very large cooperative that in digging with Fermondo uh, become 
a, 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 a ch change his model from a, a bookshop to a platform providing uh, uh, books. And last, Twitter was not invented in Barcelona, but still I want to bring this case <laughs> because uh, now the price of Twitter is being sold down because of the um, uh, um, uh, down of the of the price of Twitter because of the uh, going into uh, Borsa. And what about if Twitters buy Twitter and the tw the Twitter community buy Twitter? And this is something we already have been experiencing in the internet because we have the case of Netscape. Netscape was a commercial platform that uh, end, end up being an open commons model through engaging with Mozilla in order to survive. Actually, also Wikipedia was a company that uh, adopted an open commons model foundation with a commons uh, governance in order to uh, be successful. So that's uh, just to end up that collaborative economy need collaborative policies. And in this, the Barcelona City Council has injected a very uh, large co-creation of public policies with the sector, injecting an interdepartmental transversal group in the City Council, injecting a group of 20 uh, experiences in the city with the City Council in order to <laughs> define the policies, and there been a, a, a monthly meetup and an annual event to define the policies, and finally, with a participative website, injecting. Uh, 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 support to the different uh, uh, policy ideas from the previous steps. So, and that's uh, all for now. Thank you. Do you want to sit there? Well, thanks, Mayo. Again, again, there'll be chances to ask more detailed questions about what's happening in Barcelona in, um, in a moment. And just on that, your last point on Twitter, it is one of the great mysteries of the digital era that the users of Facebook and Twitter were so disorganized they didn't demand any of the value from their flotations, even though they had actually created all the value. But maybe something will change next time. Um, we're now going to, our, our last speaker in this session is going to be uh, Dan Vedderpol from uh, Peerby, uh, which really takes us into the question of how do you use assets and resources more efficiently. Uh, one of the paradoxes of the economy as a whole today is in some ways it's very efficient in production, but very inefficient in consumption. And you'll all be familiar with the number of minutes, you know, household drill is used in its lifetime, which is 13, I think. Uh, and one of the effects of massive inequality is there are quite a few people in a city like this who own maybe 10, 20 houses around the world uh, they never use. And the statistic, which I heard the other day, some of you may know, is the, the number of days the average American yacht is used in a year. Can you guess what the answer to that is? Tw 12 days a year. <laughs> so someone should create a sharing platform for yachts, um, that's, uh, which are otherwise sadly underused. Anyway, PRB is, uh, <laughs> is, is, is part of um, the answer to this, and uh, we're going to hear from Dan. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Yes, um, I would like to start uh, by telling you a little bit about the inspiration for, uh, for PRB and the, and the platform. Because um, it all started for me on a, um, well, not the best day in my life. In 2009, uh, my house burned down. Um, I, I lost my job. Um, uh, my, uh, my girlfriend broke up with me. And suddenly, in, within a matter of a few days, everything that I was attached to was gone. And I was left with nothing. Um, and um, this, this required for me to develop a new skill. I, I had to learn how to ask for help. And uh, by doing so, I discovered two things. I discovered that people really love to share, if you ask them. And uh, I also discovered that we live in a world of abundance. We, if we just connect to each other, there's more than enough. Um, so when I, when I started applying that thought to the way we, we use the things that we own, um, I started thinking, is, is, there, is there a smarter way? Because most of our rooms are empty all day. Uh, most of our cars sit in parking lots. Um, and most of our stuff is in cupboards and sheds and, and, and collecting dust. Um, so. I thought, what if we could just ask around for that stuff? If we can post a request, we send that around in a city, uh, neighbors can respond to it, um, we connect people in a, in a chat, and then they, 
uh, uh, negotiate a deal and they, and they pick it up. So that's what we, uh, we built and what we launched in, uh, in 2012 in, uh, in Amsterdam. Um, we started with a, with a free uh, borrowing platform and um, uh, about a year ago we added a, a rental uh, model to it as well. So it's now possible to not just borrow items but also to rent items. And the reason we did this is because we discovered that our users um, were looking for more convenience. So we basically we're competing with, with the, the Amazons of this world and it's, there's no experience um, made as easy as buying something online. It's a few clicks, it comes to your door and it's done. It's very efficient and, and basically this is what we have to compete with uh, when, we, when we're trying uh, to get people to share items. So we created a platform that uh, offers convenience and quality products and um, also allows people to, to pay for the items. And what was interesting is that this was an, actually a request from the people using the products, not offering the products. Um, we have uh, 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 literally a billion uh, euros worth of supply. People love to share their products. Uh, but what was harder for us to find was people that were willing to use these products. Because borrowing feels like a, a, a special, uh, something you, 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 you only uh, ask for in a special situation when you need some help. And as soon as you turn it into a transaction, it becomes uh, uh, something that you can do every day. So that's why we created this. Um, <clears throat> and the reason uh, we're doing this is, is well, we, we're a social enterprise and we're a B Corp. And basically that means we have, we have multiple goals. Our, our uh, um, big mission is that we want to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable <laughs> consumption. Um, but while doing this, we're, we're doing more than just that. We're connecting people in, in cities. Uh, we started in Amsterdam, but we're now connecting uh, over a quarter of a million people uh, in Europe and the United States. And um, Sharon L, together with True Price, uh, did some research in the Netherlands and found that in 2014, um, the, a combination of four sharing platforms generate to 4 million euros in social capital. Um, so that's just, just the social capital that's created by sharing. Basically, they, they try to look at what's the, the impact that this has on the lives of people uh, and try to express that in, in a monetary value. Um, I would love for this value to actually end up in our bank account because that means that we could do more, but this is, this is not the case. Um, <clears throat> so um, then uh, we're generating environmental uh, impact. And uh, this is a recent uh, Dutch study that uh, looked at all the different uh, uh, aspects of our uh, ecological footprint. And basically they found something that was, to me, was stunning. I know that I... I created PAB uh, because I wanted to reduce the, uh, the amount of environmental impact of stuff, but I did not know that we were actually working on the biggest problem uh, when, when looking at our, our ecological footprint. Uh, usually uh, when you see research, it's just about the carbon emissions or it's just about the land use, and then you, see, you can't really see the overall effect. Um, this is a study that combines all that, land use, carbon emissions, uh, uh, toxins, and then you see that you know the the impact of stuff is really uh, massive. Um, so what we hope to achieve by 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 letting people share is is basically a more is a is a more circular future for consumer products. Um, what's interesting, I don't know whether this is uh, the same in other countries, but in the Netherlands it seems that circular economies. Mindshare is dominated by building companies and waste companies. Um, so it seems that, that it al it's almost as if circular economy is mostly about recycling. But what's interesting is that if you recycle something, you might be able to reuse it twice or, or three times. Um, if you share something, you're able to use the same materials um, well, up to hundreds of times. So sharing is a much more effective way of creating a circular economy. Um, basically, uh, recycling is, is a you know is a last resort. Once once something is it, when, once we're no longer able to repair or share, that's when we should recycle. 
Um, <clears throat> so I, I already mentioned it would be great if this value, the social value that we generate and this environmental value that we generate would be <laughs> deposited in the bank account of my company. Um, because building uh, a social enterprise like this that has uh, 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 social goals is quite tough because we, we, we're creating value on three uh, fronts, basically. But we're only receiving value on one. And that is the, the value that the market has given to, to what we're doing. Um, and so for a lot of uh, platforms, for a lot of social, social enterprise, the, the model is dictated by this, this formula here. Um, is our customer acquisition cost um, smaller or equal to the lifetime value of a customer? And when we, that V, that value right there, that's only the monetary value that we're delivering, not the social or the environmental value. So my, my question to us as a society is, do we want to value these other types of value um, and, 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 and help build these types of platforms so that we can do more than just uh, build money, but also build a, a strong society and a strong community? Thank you. Would you like to take a seat? So if, if all of our speakers could take a seat. Um, well, I <laughs> and we're going to play. Musical all right. One, two. See, I've no idea what's going on. Um, so we've got a few minutes for, um, for, for comments or questions from, from any of you here. Um, I will also want each of our speakers to talk about where, where they might be in five or ten years' time. What, what, what might it, uh, how could they get to be absolutely part of mainstream life, whether in terms of specific business models, as Dan was just saying, or in terms of policy environments. One interesting development, which I don't think has been mentioned today, is what Sweden's done in the last few months with the new tax breaks for maintenance and repair of consumer goods, shifting the tax system really to encourage that versus buying something new. And there might be many other <laughs> policy enablers of that kind. So we've got one uh, question or comment here, uh, right at the back and here at the front. So if you could keep your comments so pithy, or your questions pithy, start, start here. Thank you. I'm, I'm uh, with, with the microphone. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm interested in the uh, geographic dimension. Um, we, we heard. Uh, examples from, from different uh, cities, examples that are rooted in local history, like my Mayo's examples, but also that are contemporary and using kind of globalizable platforms. So, pardon? I can stand up. Uh, and so I'm wondering uh, to what extent, maybe using the example in, uh, in uh, Barcelona, to what extent there are models where we can anticipate that Barcelona might become an exporter of social innovation in Europe, or par Paris might become an exporter. Or to what extent there are models that are not easily exported because they require deep histories, deep yeah. local ecosystems. Yeah. How important is, is context? Um, here at the back there, Rebecca. Yeah. Hello. Does the microphone, yeah, it works. My name is Janusz Spey uh, from the SFS Dortmund, the German uh, research center on social innovation. And I would like to pick up Dan's last point on how to transform the value that is being created into in common structures, so maybe particularly directed at Dan and Mario, and into monetary value so that commoners can actually live off their activities. And then here at the front, Ruby. Thank you. Hi, yes. Um, I'm Anna. I'm from Community Action MK. Uh, and I have a slightly provocative question to probably all of you, but I'm thinking to Dan in particular. Uh, companies like uh, Airbnb or Amazon being mentioned, we know that they avoid paying corporate tax. We know that they have very poor practices in terms of paying living wages. How, how do companies like this, how do, that, how do they make you feel? What, what's your view on, you know, they're being mentioned as sort of models for, you know, for... Uh, economy sort of um, ways of doing things, but they're not doing great things. Next. Yeah, I don't think Dan was advocating not paying tax, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next. I'm Zenichi from Federal University of Sergipe from Brazil. I have two questions. Uh, I, 
I want to know if you think that uh, the collaborative economy is the new stock market. And uh, when you say well, local... What do you mean by that? Stock market. But what, what do you mean? Uh, to invest, to... Oh, I see, right, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, because you, you were talking about that. And when you talk about local and global, what do you think about the boundaries? Because, for example, um, we have the language boundary. Uh, the world doesn't speak English uh, like we think, yeah? So when you think about local and global, what do you mean, okay? Okay, well, let's take some, some answers from each of you to, if you can weave together answers to these questions with perhaps your view of where the, what the future might hold, how standardised, how local, how context specific, how much will this be the main game in investment? Maybe, Dan, you could start and we'll move along the panel. All right. Um, yes. Well, I am a, um, I saw a sign uh, in the other room. Are you uh, a technology or a future optimist or a pessimist? I, uh, I usually take the optimistic view. Um, I believe that sharing makes complete sense. And um, we, we've only recently started developing the, the basically the network technology that enables us to share. And um, I think we're going to see uh, we're going to see massive changes in 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 the well maybe near future already. Um, because of these networks becoming more and more powerful. I think we've only seen very little of, of the influence of a network. We, we've only kind of networked information so far. Uh, the, the, the internet's first like, original name was the, the information superhighway, and that's really what we've created. But we're now starting to connect more and more uh, to these networks. We're starting connect, uh, to, to connect things through the Internet of Things. We're starting to connect value and currency and contracts through blockchain. We're starting to connect um, mobility through driverless cars. I mean, the implication of, of stacking all these networks together, I think, is, is going to be huge and is really going to change uh, our ideas about scarcity. Um, it's going to basically, I think it will do to the scarcity of products what the Internet did to the scarcity of information, completely uh, transform it. So, um, I'm very optimistic about the future of sharing, and specifically the sharing of, of goods. Um, and I, I think it's going to help us transition to a, to a much more sustainable uh, way of doing that. I think it, it would be, we can help accelerate that through the society and through government if we start giving the right incentives. And this is about uh, kind of capturing the, the value, other values to your uh, question. Um, Right now, uh, a lot of the taxation uh, that we do is encouraging consumption. So we, we tax labor, uh, but we do not tax resources, um, which makes it you know, cheaper to import something from China and, 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 and not repair it if it's broken than to manufacture something locally and maintain it and repair it and, and have like, these high quality products. Um, so I think if we, if we look at how we've constructed taxation and, and things like that, we, we should start capturing positive and ne negative uh, social value in a monetary system, whether it's through taxation or things like these, these carbon emission rights. Okay. Yeah. Right. Maya. Okay. Uh, regarding the question of sustain individual sustainability of people who contribute to collaborative economy, I think the platform cooperatives is a, a, a reaction from the open commons uh, movement in order to assure individual uh, sustainability through connecting with the cooperative movement. But I would like to also bring into the, uh, the, the discussion the, the possibility of basic income. Actually, uh, Barcelona has won a, 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 a European project with 20 million euros in order to test basic income in one of our neighborhoods. And we are going to test what happens if you give uh, a basic income to the people who is contributed to collaborative economy or not, or if you decide for them what do they have to do with the basic income. So we are going to be testing uh, basic income in Barcelona and we will so let you know. So conditional basic income. No, we are going to, to, to test different uh, modalities okay, yeah, in order to yeah. see what, what works uh, yeah. better in the neighborhood. Right. Um, 
Regarding the question of local, global context, I think uh, context is very important, culture is very important, uh, but we tend to think in terms of the experiences, the platforms, uh, and I would like to, to put into the debate the question that the main obstacles for the scalability of a social post-collaborative economy, I don't see it in the lack of business model, lack of cre uh, creativity, uh, I don't see it in the sector. I see it in the public administration. I think that there is where there are the main uh, barriers. And here I am referring to, uh, we have to have present that the, the, the main, the first buyer of technological industry are the public administrations, are the ones who have, are pursuing more technology and more technological development. So if the public administration, instead of uh, buying to the traditional telecom, they buy into uh, uh, local uh, 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 cooperatives of free and open source of a project or, or the collaborative economy with software pur purpose type of uh, solutions, then we will see the, the disempower of certain technological industry and the empower of uh, social purpose technological industry. I want also to, to put into the debate the question of corruption and, the, and bad practices in the public administration regarding uh, uh, collaborative economy uh, uh, companies. I just want to put the case of the, the, the commissioner of digital agenda, main responsible of the digital agenda in the European Union after quitting his uh, position, six months later went to go work with Uber. And uh, uh, Barroso uh, now is go working for uh, Goldman Sachs, which is one of the founders uh, of Uber. So I think we, there is where we have the barriers to uh, scalability. I also want to say that the limitation for public postures to uh, a local uh, a economy and how the lo uh, uh, public process is being organized is also limiting the scalability of collaborative economy. It's like if there would be a, um, a invisible ceiling. Women are very used to uh, uh, this idea. We have, there is an invisible uh, ceiling for women to, to scale, no? There is an invisible ceiling for uh, social, a, a collaborative economy that we have to be aware of that is there and put the conditions for resisting and changing it. And for that, it's very important that we connect it with uh, uh, other of the questions that we uh, inject with the financial system and we actually uh, make a collaborative financial system with the uh, crowdfunding. I think uh, that would be extremely important. Yeah, thanks, Maya. <laughs> Wait, yeah. We're almost out of time, so uh, brief comments from Phil and Peter. I, I think for me, a lot, a lot of the questions, um, when I reflect on it, I think the thing for me is really about, we try and do the, the smallest thing we can do today that has the biggest impact. And we're very focused on making those, those step changes, those small step changes towards where we need to get to. So whether it's about um, the tax questions and, and how they come up, or whether it's about um, should be, people be consuming less, uh, which I totally agree with, I love, I love Dan's talk. I think it's all about, we see crowdfunding as a way of, it's a very crude way of, of sharing at the moment, which is sharing with money. People have a lot more than their money to share, their, their, their skills, their possessions, their whatever else, their ambitions, everything. So I think we see the development of it very much going that way, which is widening out from just money into other things. But I, I'd say to everyone, it's about that smallest thing we can do today that's gonna have the biggest impact and let's get on and do it. And I think with the, with the tax questions, a lot of it comes back to, um, you know, I can choose where I buy my coffee from, and so I can go to an independent coffee store. When it comes back to uh, a Google or an Amazon question, that's a little bit harder to, to find those alternatives. And I think uh, we're looking for people to find ways of building replacement services for those that, that do do what they're supposed to do, do what we want them to do, so we can actually replace them in our lives. I think until we have that, it's going to be very hard for people to make that replacement. Peter, what hasn't been said that should have been said? Um, is it the next stock market? Yes, I guess the challenge is <laughs> what kind of businesses are traded on that market. I hope it's more of these kinds of businesses than what we normally see traded, but I'm still on the fence on that one. Global versus local? Well, I think what's fascinating, particularly when you look at the open source movement, is the idea that you can take something made in one country and put it in another relatively easily at a low cost or no cost. Fermondo, made in Germany, now all over the world. Uh, there's a UK platform for crowdfunding, which is now set up in a, a copy of that in South Africa at no cost. Again, because you can take the open source. I met a fantastic guy in Italy at, uh, at Europe's biggest maker fair, 
uh, two weeks ago, who made an open source wheelchair, which you can make for just less than 200 euros. And his idea is that people in developing economies where you don't have access to a wheelchair, which costs around 2,000 euros if you have to buy it from a traditional provider, can print and make that in their local area. He's made the design, you can take it. I think there's a challenge about how he's going to make a living. And uh, as we didn't answer that question, and I don't think uh, many commons-based researchers and comments have, have really nailed the answer on how are you going to make money and make a living out of the commons. But I think global and local is it's really fascinating. And finally, I think also what is local to you? Uh, uh, you know, so on Phil's platform, I assume most people who buy a share in a company, a local company, are from that area. But you know, I'm from Denmark, and I I often invest in Danish companies or Danish projects because I also have a local connection to that. I buy uh, albums from American bands or South American bands because I have connections to those bands. So local and global is also a bit more of a gray zone, I think, in the 21st century. So I think it's more around how these platforms connect people who share a common cause and a common value, and then make those projects a reality. I think that's a lot, easier, a lot easier using some of these platforms <laughs> than it was five years ago. I have a, another two hours of talking. <laughs> <laughs> but you can grab him o over lunch and he will, he'll give you the uh, compressed version of those two hours. Just, just one, one final comment from me before I let you go and share lunch. Um, about two weeks ago, there was a, a sort of parallel gathering to this in Seoul, in Korea. Uh, I, I chair a sort of advisory committee for the mayor there, who's, as some of you will know, quite a, a passionate advocate of the the sharing economy. Um, one of the things Seoul, I think, has done very well, and maybe more than anywhere in Europe, that's a bit what Maya was talking about, is creating essentially test beds across the city where new ideas, either from startups or social economy projects, can, can try out different uses of technology, different business models, but working very closely with the city administration to make sure policy is enabling and supportive. Uh, no one in the UK has done anything <laughs> remotely like that, uh, but this, this surely is the kind of partnership we, we should be trying to get going. And the other angle of conversation in <coughs> Seoul, which hasn't been mentioned here, uh, but sort of sitting, looking down on the city um, is perhaps a good prompt, was that quite possibly in the next five or ten years, the whole geography of cities is going to change, partly because of <laughs> autonomous vehicles, rivalist cars, partly because of retailing increasingly transformed by not both online and drones. And the implication is the main uses of space in cities of the last 30 or 40 years, which has been basically shopping centers and car parks, may quite quickly become redundant. And there's going to be a huge demand for creative ways of using those spaces for some kind of um, social good. So one thing perhaps worth investing in is alternative car park ideas. <laughs> because an amazing amount of land is devoted to basically um, looking after cars, and we won't need that really quite soon. And my guess is the sharing economy sort of tools may be much better at answering those questions than uh, alternatives, which probably require you to pull them down and build something else, which is not so great for the ecology. Anyway, we have um, uh, lunch outside now uh, for about, how long do we have? Till half past one, and then there's some absolutely fantastic parallel sessions which will dig deep into all sorts of great projects. But can you join me in thanking our four fantastic speakers?